The second generation Pi Zero W just came out, so in this video, I'm going to cover the main differences between it and the original Pi Zero W, run some benchmarks, and then lastly, I'll cover how to add an external antenna connector to your Pi Zero 2W. I'll also be giving away five of the new boards with the external antenna modification already done, so check the description for information on how to enter. And now to the comparison. First, the main differences. The new Pi Zero 2W has a quad-core processor compared to the single-core processor on the original Pi Zero W. They are both clocked at 1 GHz and have 512 MB of RAM, so that part's the same. However, the new chip has much better single-thread performance, as we'll see during the benchmark section. The Pi Zero 2W removes the run or reset header pins, so that's no longer easily available. However, there's still a run test pad on the bottom if you really want to connect anything to it. Similarly, the composite mode TV out pins were removed, but they're still available on the bottom as a test pad. Finally, the Wi-Fi chip now has a shield over it, similar to other Raspberry Pi models. According to the Pi Foundation, this makes it easier for the device to remain compliant and allows the Pi Zero 2W to now have a modular certification from the FCC, making it easier to use in other end products. Other than those changes, everything else is fairly similar. Now let's take a look at some benchmarks. On the left, you can see the single-threaded and multi-threaded test results for the new Pi Zero 2W compared to the single-threaded results from the original Pi Zero W on the right. Even with single-threaded performance, the Pi Zero 2W has great improvement. The Pi Foundation claims a 40% increase in single thread performance, and this measured improvement from 42.2 events per second to 58.2 events per second represents an increase of 37.9%, which is in the ballpark of the claimed increase. They also claim a 5x performance increase for tasks that are fully multi-threaded, and the multi-threaded result of 232 events per second is a 5.5x increase over the original Pi Zero W. So that speed up actually exceeds the claim. For the memory performance benchmarks, there is also an excellent boost in throughput, both in single-threaded performance and multi-threaded performance. The original Pi Zero W comes in at 119.5 megabytes per second, while the new Pi Zero W comes in at 446.73 megabytes per second for a single-threaded test, and 1385.19 megabytes per second for a multi-threaded test. So in summary, the Pi Zero 2W is a no-brainer upgrade if you have tasks that can be multi-threaded. But, even for single-thread performance, it's worth the upgrade cost if you need a mild bump in performance. And now, as promised, here is how to add an external antenna connector to the Pi Zero 2W. We've covered why you might want to do this in previous videos, so in this video, I'll just go over the modification directly. I've also had several requests to show how to do the modification using just a regular soldering iron, so I'll show that technique as well afterwards. For the first and preferred modification way, you'll want to have some 6337 solder paste, no clean flux, hot air rework station, and a board preheater. Set the preheater to 100 degrees Celsius and set your hot air to 280 degrees Celsius and medium airflow. Your station may be a bit different, so you may have to adjust these figures. Start by cutting the trace to the old antenna using an X-Acto knife. Making a small cut on each end and then rolling back the trace works well. This helps improve signal quality, and at the end I'll show an example of why this is important. Dab on the solder paste onto the area until you have a light covering. Once it heats up slightly, it'll be easy to push around so it doesn't have to be perfect, and worst case you can just run a soldering iron over everything to deposit the right amount of solder over all the pads. Add the 0201 0 ohm resistor at this time, and place the U.FL connector to the side so it can start heating up. Heat the area until the solder paste melts, distributing it as needed until all the pads are well covered. You can push the resistor into place, and once the solder surface tension grabs it, it should self-align. Now add a bit of flux and position the U.FL connector over the pads. When viewed from the top, the side that has no visible connection to the ring on top is the side that has the center connector. Heat the area, and once the solder is melted, bump the connector with the tweezers until all surfaces are wet with solder and the connector is cleanly aligned. Remove the heat and clean off any excess flux using isopropyl alcohol. That's all there is to it. Now for the technique using just a regular soldering iron. Fair warning up front, this is more difficult to do than just using hot air. So if you're going to attempt it, make sure you buy a couple extra U.FL connectors and jumper resistors so you have a few chances at it. For this technique, you're going to want a regular soldering iron, some solder of your choice, and some flux. 
If you can get a magnifying glass or loop so you can visually check the solder joints after you're done, that'll help a bit as well, but it's not strictly necessary, as long as you have good eyesight. I'm using just a regular chisel tip for this demonstration, since that's the most common tip that'll be available. In this case, it's just a standard Hakko T18 D16 tip. I'm using an iron heated to 400 degrees Celsius for this, since there are some large ground planes that we'll need to heat up. To start, cut the trace just like in the previous technique. Next, let's cover the two pads for the resistor and the center connection pad for the U.FL connector with flux. Now take the iron and melt a bit of solder on one side. Flip the iron over so the solder is on the bottom side and then drag the iron over the surface slowly enough so that it tins all three of the desired pads. Now for the tiny 0201 zero ohm jumper resistor. Add it to the board and get it close to where it needs to be. Now, touch the corner of the iron to the U.FL center connection pad. Since this is the same piece of copper as one of the pads where the resistor will be connecting, it should melt. Bump the resistor over until the surface tension grabs it and holds it in place. For the other side, again melt a little bit of solder onto one side of the iron, flip it over so that side is down, and then just touch it to the other side of the O201 resistor. You may have to do this a couple of times until it heats up enough and forms a connection. You should see the resistor snap into place once both sides are connected. Now for the U.FL connector. Add flux to the rest of the pads and the center pad, and then position the U.FL connector. Melt some solder onto one side of the iron, flip it over, and then touch it to the center connector. This should melt everything on that pad, and at this point you can position the connector how you like it. Then. For the two shield connections in turn, apply solder to one side of the iron, flip it over so that side is down, and then touch the iron right to the interface between the connector and the pad on the board. These connections will likely take a little longer for the solder to flow because they are ground connections, and the ground plane is conducting heat away. If the solder is not flowing nicely and workable, add flux or slightly increase the heat and run the iron over it again. Once done, clean off excess flux using isopropyl alcohol, and that's it. Lastly in this video, I wanted to cover some questions that have come up on previous videos about why I cut the trace on the old antenna instead of just leaving it alone, or removing only one of the connecting capacitors. The more technical explanation is that at high frequencies having stubs sticking out can cause reflections that degrade performance, and putting multiple antennas in parallel can also cause reflections due to an impedance mismatch. However, I also like to try these things out for myself, and just see how bad they actually are. So for this test, I compared signal levels for three boards including one prepared with the cut trace as preferred, one that disconnects the other antenna by desoldering the capacitor, and one that leaves everything connected. As shown in the diagram, the one with the cut trace has the best signal level by far, followed by the one with the capacitor removed. The one with everything still connected brings up last place. So given the choice, you will get the best results by cutting the trace. Not exactly unexpected, but it's good to see these things for yourself. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like and let me know down in the comments about any projects you are currently working on. And don't forget to enter to win one of the five Pi Zero 2W boards that I'm giving away. Information is in the video description. And that's it. Subscribe if you want to support more videos like this one. And thanks for watching.